With the highest votes, week 7 was the top pick for videos to make, which is all about transcription. Here's a quick overview for where this topic fits in with the rest of the videos that we've talked about. DNA to RNA to proteins is the central dogma theory. To get from DNA to RNA, I have to do transcription, which is what this video is about. Each process can be broken up into three parts, initiation, elongation, and termination. Now saying that, I can see people getting confused with initiation factors, elongation factors, and termination factors, so listen carefully. Although each of the three processes can be considered to have all three steps, only translation has things called initiation factors, elongation factors, and termination factors. To reiterate, if you see IF, EF, or TF, that refers to translation exclusively, which I will not discuss further in this video. Like I said, transcription is the process of reading DNA to make RNA. Just like with DNA, RNA nucleotides are put down in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Now for the most part, DNA replication is the same for eukaryotes and prokaryotes. When we're talking about transcription, though, there are significant differences that you need to know. So to start us off, I'm going to talk about prokaryotic transcription because it's more simple. With the scope of this class, here's what you need to know. Let's start by talking about initiation. Bacteria have one type of RNA polymerase. Depending on whether or not it's ready to transcribe and will transcribe, we give it another name. To start, the core enzyme scans the DNA looking for a place to transcribe. The core enzyme is made up of five subunits, two alpha, a beta, beta prime, and omega. It will continue to scan until it finds the right place to start. It actually doesn't know when to start without the help of two sigma factors, one that binds at the negative 10 and the, and the, other, and the other at the negative 35 box. Once a core enzyme has sigma factors bound to it, we call it the hollow enzyme. We rename it because it's ready to start and knows where to start, so it will. That's all during initiation and happens at a stretch of DNA known as the promoter. Let me say a little about sigma factors. There are multiple types of sigma factors. Sigma 70 is the housekeeping one. It does most of the generic gene transcription for bacteria to live and grow. Sigma factors allow bacteria to be very specific with the genes they transcribe. Let's use the heat shock gene for example. Let's say I didn't have the specificity that sigma factors bring, but needed the heat shock gene activated. Here's what my DNA looks like. As a bacteria cell, I'd know that I have a heat shock gene somewhere in my DNA, but without sigma factors, I'd have no clue where it is. To get the heat shock proteins, I'd probably have to randomly transcribe genes, perhaps transcribe them all, hoping that I'll make the mRNA for the proteins that will help me deal with heat shock. Instead of having to go through all that trouble, with the help of sigma factors, all I have to do is translate the specific sigma factor, in this case, sigma 32, and all that gets transcribed is precisely the gene I need. Prokaryotic transcription doesn't have anything unique with elongation. Just know that RNA polymerase is reading the template strand to write RNA. Therefore, the RNA it's making is the same sequence as the sense, coding, and anti-template strands, just with the U's instead of the T's. For termination, there are one of two ways most genes have to stop transcription. The first one is called intrinsic termination. We often use the word intrinsic when talking about motivation. If a student has intrinsic motivation, they are motivated to study and learn on their own, even if there's no teacher helping them to do so. It's the same for RNA polymerase and termination. The RNA polymerase doesn't need the help of any other protein to help it stop. When the gene has been transcribed, there will be a CG-rich sequence transcribed in the mRNA that forms a hairpin. If the hairpin is followed by many U's, the RNA polymerase detaches from the DNA and stops transcription. This is what makes the trip operand stop. Because RNA polymerase can stop itself in this form of termination, it's also known as rho independent. For rho dependent termination then, RNA polymerase needs the help of a protein called rho to help it stop. There will be a sequence in the mRNA that is translated, which tells rho to bind to the RNA. This sequence is called the RUT or RUT site. Rho is a hexamer with six identical subunits and forms the shape of a ring. After it binds to the DNA, it slides along the RNA like a ring can slide along a piece of string until it catches up to the RNA polymerase. Once it catches up, it kicks the RNA polymerase off and transcription terminates. Now pause the video, draw pictures to help you remember, teach it to someone or to yourself to help you remember. Here's a small hint. 
If we're talking about a protein that has a Greek letter as its name, it's like alpha, beta, or rho, it's part of prokaryotic transcription. Also, a cool fact about prokaryotic DNA. The DNA is doubled up with genes, which is just my way of explaining how they have one gene if read one way, and another gene if read the other way, like this. Now let's shift gears to talk about eukaryotic transcription. Eukaryotic transcription is much more complex for a number of reasons. One, RNA is unstable and subject to digestion. Where prokaryotes didn't have to worry because translation and transcription happen at the same time, eukaryotes have to process RNA to make it last long enough to be used. Two, along with that processing, there are introns and exons in eukaryotic DNA, the introns of which need to be taken out before translation happens. So initiation. Instead of having RNA polymerase scan the DNA, eukaryotic transcription starts with a transcription factor. There are actually six transcription factors we learned about in this class, the binding order of which is D-A-B-F-E-H. A nice way to remember this is David A. Bednar fixes every hair, or David A. Bednar favors excellent hair, as is written in your packet. Both are true. TF2D and TF2H are the only ones we want you to know the functions of. TF2D is the first one on the scene because part of this transcription factor is a protein called TBP, which stands for TATA binding protein. The TATA box is a recognition sequence on the DNA that helps in knowing where to start transcription. Once TF2D is there, the rest will join as well. During the whole process of transcription factors assembling, the RNA polymerase is also brought in. TF2H is the last one there and has two functions, a helicase ability to unzip the DNA and a kinase ability to give energy to the RNA polymerase. That energy is needed to kickstart the whole process, allowing it to leave the promoter and to add a cap, which brings us to the next step, elongation. During elongation, mRNA undergoes three steps of processing. The first is adding a 7-methylguanosine cap to the 5' prime end. There's a region on RNA polymerase 2 called the carboxy terminal domain, or CTD for short. This region has a lot of amino acids that can be phosphorylated, so the PSTT or PST amino acids. Remember the two T's. Only if the CTD is phosphorylated can it add this cap, which protects it from 5' prime to 3' prime exonucleases from digesting the mRNA. In order for the mRNA to survive, the moment it gets long enough to reach the CTD, it gets capped. Otherwise, a 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease will eat it and kick off the RNA polymerase. This cap is attached through a triphosphate bridge and is added backwards like this. So if I was the 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease, I'd normally see this 5' prime end and eat away from there, but since this cap has been added backwards, I would look for a 5' prime end, but not see it because this end is technically a 3' prime end. Thus, it gets protected. The cap serves also as a way for the mRNA to be shipped out properly and to be translated properly. The next step is splicing. The type of machinery needed to splice is called the spliceosome, which includes a group of proteins called SNRMP, or SNRPs. The RN stands for RNA, and the P stands for protein. These proteins recognize introns and cut them out. They need to do so with exact precision. If they cut out incorrectly, the resulting protein very well could be drastically different. To help them be precise, SNRPs hold a piece of RNA which has to base pair exactly with the mRNA for splicing to happen. That piece of RNA they hold is called SNRNA. There are two SNRPs that we want you to know in this class, U1 and U2. U1 holds RNA that recognizes the 5' prime end of the intron, and U2 recognizes the branch point. If you don't know what I'm referring to, please watch the video I've included in the description below. When talking about splicing, it's important to talk about why we even have introns, which for the most part don't code for any proteins. Well, if the DNA didn't have introns, it'd look like this. Now, at random, I'm going to draw three mutations because mutations are pretty random. With no introns, all three mutations would hit an exon, which, since codes for a protein, could cause a significant change in the protein. Now, with introns, and since introns are so much longer than exons, if I was to randomly draw three places of mutations, maybe it'd look like this. So introns add kind of like a buffer zone for mutations, where if they happened, it'd less likely fall in an exon. Plus, if we're going to be cutting them out anyway, might as well make them really long to decrease the chance even further. Another reason for introns is that it allows alternative splicing. In alternative splicing, we alternate which exons act as introns, like this. If I have a strand of DNA with these exons, I could come up with these combinations if I alternatively spliced it. Though the order needs to stay the same, 
you can see how I can come up with different combinations. That allows me to code for more proteins with the same stretch of DNA. The last step is to add a poly A tail. This step can be clumped together with termination. There are two models for how this works. The first is called the torpedo model. When the desired mRNA has been synthesized, there will be a sequence transcribed called the poly A site. This poly A site triggers an endonuclease to cut there, to which polymerase A then adds about 200 A's to the newly formed 3' end. The newly made 5' end doesn't have a cap, so an exonuclease starts to digest the RNA until it catches up with the polymerase, to which it then kicks off, terminating transcription. The other model is called the anti-termination model, which I won't actually talk about in this video. Now, genes can have upstream and downstream enhancer elements. These are places in the DNA that proteins can bind to to regulate transcription. The last thing I need to mention is that there are three types of RNA polymerase in eukaryotes. Pol1 transcribes large subunit RNA. Pol2 transcribes mRNA, and Pol3 transcribes small segments of RNA, such as tRNA, small subunit rRNA, and non-coding RNA. The larger the polymerase number, the smaller size RNA they make. Here's another way to remember the three. 1, 2, 3, RMT. Now take a second and review all of this material. When you're ready, see if you can sort these into their proper category or categories.